it's so interesting that, you know, Earth Day, I remember really, really well. I was 17 when the first Earth Day happened. About the time. Yeah, you were my age, kind of, roughly. Yeah. Now I'm at the 50th anniversary of Earth Day right now. And, and, and I remember it. It was, it was a sea change, Jamie. It was mm-hmm. like, in those days, people thought nothing of throwing everything out the window of their cars as you passed. Hi, Jamie. So nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you too. It's been a minute since we've been in touch since like 2018, kind of, but we've never actually yeah. talked. So I know that you've done some documentaries on um, different environmental disasters in history, like the Dust Bowl. How has, um, I guess, your work as a historian or a historical documentary filmmaker kind of contextualized this moment in history for you? Mark Twain is supposed to have said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And so I'm always really struck by what a great teacher the past is, that human nature doesn't change. And so we see in today's events antecedents in previous events. Several years ago in 2012, we did a film called The Dust Bowl, which was at that point then the greatest man-made ecological disaster uh, in world history. It is no longer that. But it became, with a history, with a film that basically never mentioned climate change, it became a huge object lesson in climate change. What's interesting about history is its durability, that its themes are evergreen. You know, Earth Day, I remember really, really well. I was 17 when the first Earth Day happened. About the time. Yeah, you were my age, kind of, roughly. And yeah. now I'm at the 50th anniversary of Earth Day right now. And, and I was about to turn 18 that in a couple of months. And I remember it. It was, it was a sea change, Jamie. It was mm-hmm. like, in those days, people thought nothing of throwing everything out the window of their cars as you passed. And I've never seen a world like that. I mean, like, obviously we're in environmental destruction right now, but it's considered rude to do something like that, even if, you know, it's considered okay for corporations to trash everything. It's interesting how it's, things can get normalized so quickly. And so I'm wondering if, you know, maybe in the future, the next Ken Burns who makes documentary films about the history about this moment in time, um, will will have seen it, it will have seemed like common sense to take urgent action on climate change. And that's very, very human to do that. It's so right. interesting that you can have an impulse, you can have this overnight, all of a sudden, every, all the roadsides cleared up for the most part. And people seem, yeah, of course, that's a ridiculous thing to do. But, but thoughtlessness always reimposes itself in, in the human story. Right. Um, there's, I, I grew up where there were still, I can remember, fountains or signs, fading signs that said color. So there's oh, wow. a huge amount of change and there's been no change because there's been Charlottesville. There's still, if you go online, just incredible racists out there. Our president, you know, tweets racist things. Where, you know, what happens? So I think what we have to do, what history teaches us is that we are both things. And sometimes within us, we've got a tendency towards generosity and a tendency towards greed. And I think learning the lessons of the past permit us to address ourselves. We have the environmental history to go with us from Emerson and Thoreau and from John Muir in the national parks. We know what to do with wild places. Does it completely check the acquisitive nature of people who look at a a beautiful forest and think bored feet? people who look at, at, a, at a river and think dam and hydroelectric power, people who look at a beautiful canyon and wonder what mineral rights can be extracted. No, it right. doesn't end that impulse. Well, but that impulse have- is, it's just interesting that you say that because right now um, with the coronavirus, um, there was a recent EPA decision or Trump's EPA decided to pretty much say that all environmental regulations were kind of like on pause indefinitely because of the virus um and what they said was i don't know they were just like it's the virus it's the virus that's why but pretty much it's given corporations a green light to pollute which means that some people see 
a health crisis and they think, oh, how can I, you know, help and make this better? But these corporations look at this and see, how can I profit off of this? How can I use an opportunity of everyone's eyes being focused on the coronavirus and everyone being focused on this thing to now um, make this about making as much money as physically possible? This is the story of history and this is why history can arm you in the best possible way to understand the present moment and to go forward. Because the history will always tell you that these interests are always there in parallel with the more positive interests. After the first battle of Bull Run, unscrupulous real estate speculators were selling pieces of the battlefield, trying to set up tourist uh, things to celebrate the carnage that had just taken place. We can no longer be surprised if we are students of history that there will be attempts for the fox to guard the hen house, as you're suggesting. What we have to do is make the case for the good side, what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, to go forward, that we can see the interrelationship of human beings with this planet and we can see the increasing fragility of that. The problem is that a lot of people don't know history and it's not a matter of, oh, people are dumb or people, it's a lot of, you know, the way school teaches it is like memorize these battlefield dates and that's it. Or not, don't, don't think critically, don't think, then how are we going to be able to um, actually get out of these issues without, or, and, you know, we're going to keep being surprised by the same things and we're going to keep being blindsided by the same things over and over again and never learn. For example, Japanese internment, like people, a lot of people don't know that that even happened in the United States. And so how can you learn from something if you don't know that it happened? And then people have, you know, with like a lot of the xenophobia happening right now, it echoes xenophobia of the past that led to very bad places. I'm, I'm, I'm always saying to people, give yourself first and foremost an education in history which permits you to be the critical thinker so that when you see an immigration crisis happening at the border or say along the texas mexico line you know the antecedents that have taken place in the united states from the original putting into reservations of native americans the people who were here we're all immigrants except for them and then uh, and anthropologically, they are immigrants too, um, to up to the Japanese internment that you mentioned. All of these things fit into a pattern. And when you are dispassionately, with a discipline, understanding this rigorous history, then these decisions don't seem as complicated. And it's really easy to separate the wheat from the chaff. That is to say, the truth from the lie. And I, and I feel like, you know, people might think, oh, how does this relate to climate change? This is supposed to be a climate change. But I think it does relate a lot to the climate change. Col colonization and the current, like, systems of greed and uh, modern capitalism and everything like that is why we're in this problem in the first place. But a lot of people don't even see flaws in that. You know, we still celebrate Columbus Day. We still celebrate uh, in a lot of places. We still celebrate, um, a, like... We still have this mythology of like the founding fathers and everything was beautiful and then they made the most free, so, best so popular what, government in so, the world. Well, you don't want to get away from that. What you want to do is embrace something that doesn't throw out everything about the old and doesn't ignore all the things you say. Let's, let's admit right from the top, as I do in almost every conversation, that the guy who wrote our creed, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, stop right there owned more than 200 human beings as he as he wrote it and never saw the contradiction or the hypocrisy so you can throw him out you can throw out thomas jefferson but you can't throw out the ideas and i would suggest if you do not throw out thomas jefferson but hold his feet to the fire then you are on the way to what he his words that he didn't even understand fully could do to lead towards a more perfect union he didn't write that that's the preamble of the constitution but certainly in pursuit of happiness and happiness to him capital h happiness was the pursuit of lifelong learning in a marketplace not of things but of ideas. And so those are worthwhile things to save at the same time we hold his feet and anyone else's feet to the fire for that sanitized Madison Avenue view of history, which you quite correctly reject. Yeah. How can you have nuance in an era where everything is black and white? That's exactly right. Well, this is my argument. 
is that when you live in a computer culture in which it's ones and zeros, when you live in a media culture in which everything is, is, is black and white, young and old, uh, male or female, red state or blue state, gay or straight, you've lost the ability to select for what we share in common. And when you live in a consumer society, which is all the acquisition in the moment and not a larger sense of where we are now, we lose the ability to tolerate contradiction rather than say, oh, that all other way is completely bankrupt, throw it out. My way is the way because you'll turn off at least half the people you need to reach in order to have real meaningful change in climate. The kind of movements that you need to make with your extraordinary work has to bring along people that don't already agree with you. So here's my thing though. Like for example, within movements, and maybe this is just within the youth movements, I feel like there's been a divide. On one hand, there are the folks on Twitter who are, uh, or just anywhere who are just like, smash everything, revolution, um, you know, down like communist revolution, down with capitalism, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've seen a lot of that. Then I've seen more, you know, and, and I, I, I categorize myself in the more of the activists, the more Bernie Sanders, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez type way of thinking and politics and like, you know, trying to both balance, you know, that whole like, oh yeah, something really drastic has to change, but also like, how do we do this in a um, nuanced, meaningful, um, productive way? And then you have the folks who are just like holding on to the old or what people would call, I guess I'm talking within the climate movement, like the neoliberal hyper capitalist solve this with more free market capitalism solve this with you know you have people who want to keep the status quo who don't understand intersections of like environment and racism and things like that let me let me let me just offer the perspective we started our conversation talking about the original earth day which i remembered as someone right. especially your age it is at that time we we're in the middle of the war in vietnam i wanted to tear everything down I wanted certainly to do that. I think that the people that we look to, maybe it's AOC, who suddenly realized I can't just be arguing these things. I need to actually do something. And I think that that's what AOC had decided. The best thing to do is I'm going to run for Congress. And she overthrew the guy who had been in there forever, who's part of the Democratic leadership. And now she's doing it and, and she's found herself tempering. She hasn't been co-opted. She's just understanding that the the ability to, to, to make change and to communicate with others requires a kind of complicated dance in which you struggle not to make the other wrong, even in the face of great wrong that you see. And it's, it's an impossible task and, and why I no longer know anything and I used to know everything. <laughs>